Okay, the recording has started. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today's AIWA Los Angeles uh, section uh, town hall meeting. Uh, this is a workshop by Dr. Garrett about space environment. This is part two. Uh, part one was last year in July. Uh, it was very well received, so we continue to do uh, part two, and uh, we actually have more series coming up. Uh, hopefully, next time we can do it in Dr. Garrett's house, so we can enjoy coffee, uh, things together with him, uh, along with online attendees. Uh, so before we start the presentation, so let's show you uh, some logistics for, uh, because this is online presentation, uh, so most uh, attendees will be online. Uh, so for online folks, please mute your microphone first. Uh, if you have any question, please uh, click raise hand. Uh, try not to interrupt the presentation, but if it's needed, uh, we can ask Dr. Gary if you want to take a question in between. Uh, uh, so they do have chat option uh, that we can, but we'll mostly reserve the Q&A more toward the end of the presentation. So part one, uh, sorry, session one is from now to around lunchtime, then we have a lunch break. I'll come back 1 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, each session will be two hours, and around 3.05, uh, we wrap up the event, but if you have more questions, uh, please uh, stay, uh, if you can uh, ask the speaker. So we can more time at the end for Q&A, uh, so if you have a couple questions, make sure don't, um, uh, Dr. Garrett will have time to finish the presentation. Um, and the other thing is uh, for the local people, uh, you got the benefit of coffee, donuts. Uh, sorry for the online folks. Unfortunately, we want you to uh, come here. That's the incentive for uh, in-person attendees. Um, so we have nice donut uh, and coffee bottle water, and the restroom is on the, um, on the back, on the right-hand side. Um, so other than that, I think we are all set. Uh, so um, Dr. Gary is a distinguished speaker of AAA, is an Attaway Fellow, and uh, he was the Van Allen awardee, Attaway Van Allen awardee in 2022. Uh, he retired from JPL recently, uh, but he continued uh, to be very active uh, in this uh, uh, study and lecture lectures. And uh, he has a very good book, uh, top book uh, um, uh, on space environment. And uh, you will learn more about uh, his life than what I can say here. You can also see something on the website and the email, uh, but he, he will share an uh, interesting uh, story about his life as well. Uh, so this is a, a presentation, so it was a professional presentation, so you probably will see uh, some technical detail. We will, we will also mix with uh, uh, interesting stories. Uh, so it's going to be very exciting and uh, attractive, so also inspiring. So uh, uh, please enjoy. So more people will gradually uh, join, so don't feel disturbed. Uh, so just keep going. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Garrett. Are you ready for me to start? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself very briefly. Uh, I grew up in a small town in New Mexico called Roswell. I grew up on the Air Force Base there. My father was a career Air Force officer. I also was a career Air Force officer. And uh, employed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for 43 years. I spent 30 years in the Air Force and 43 years at JPL. Uh, they overlapped, so <laughs> I'm not, I'm not uh, I didn't have only three years to uh, be a child. But anyway, I grew up in Roswell and that, the skies there were so clear, it inspired me to be, a, uh, be an astronomer. Uh, this is my background, my career. I started out in international science fairs, uh, born in 1948. Uh, I went to Rice University. Uh, they managed to send me to the Arctic to study the aurora. I also was one of the early thunderstorm chasers. I went around, I have several magazine covers taking pictures of lightning. And I also worked on the Apollo Lunar Surface Environment Monitor, LSEP. And my thesis was on uh, solar wind interactions with the Earth's magnetosphere. After that, I was drafted and went to, and to the Vietnam War. I went to the Air Force Geophysics Laboratory, used to be called the Air Force Cambridge Research Labs, and ultimately became the Air Force Research Labs. 
there I worked on atmospheric modeling and uh, was one of the leads for spacecraft charging on the SCATHA program, spacecraft charging at high altitudes. We launched a satellite to study the effects of plasmas on spacecraft. I ended up, with, as I said, with a 30-year career in the Air Force. In 1980, uh, while I was still on active duty, uh, they sent me to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and where I started my 43-year career there. At JPL, I've been the lead for space environment effects on the different main missions, such as Voyager, Galileo, and um, had, was sent back by NASA to the Pentagon to work on Star Wars uh, because of my dual role as an Air Force officer and as a NASA employee at JPL. And there I had my own, uh, had my own payload and uh, was had a pretty good time there for several years working on the Clementine mission, which went to the moon. I came back to JPL and continued my work for defining the environments for missions such as Juno and Clipper to Europa and solar sails. And uh, also have been in, uh, had a role in defining the interstellar space environment using the Voyager data. I have defined the environments for all JPL missions to the various planets like Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and comets. Uh, so I had a fairly busy career over 43 years at JPL and 30 years in the Air Force. I was ultimately assigned as the deputy director of the Rocket Propulsion Laboratory, and I ended up as the head of all reserves uh, at the SMC, the Space and Missile Center, for several for a year or so. Anyway, let's get started on the technical part of the talk. Uh, why do we care about uh, space environments and their effects? Well, to put it bluntly, an ounce of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. If you think about it up front and you can fix it, you don't have to spend a lot of money trying to figure out what went wrong at the end. So the basic process is we define, help define the environmental models and make environmental estimates for the given mission. And then I do the environmental design requirements. And then we run into our first issue. You can overtest. For example, one of the big things we do is we actually arc the we've actually arced spacecraft like the Voyager 3, or I guess the Voyager 0 uh, spacecraft, one of my close colleagues. And that unfortunately caused it to, to go, go turn off. Based on that, they decided they'd better protect it from spacecraft charging. And that's why I was hired. Then there's under test. If you don't test for space environments, you run the risk of having a failure. And we'll be going through a bunch of those as we go through today. So you can do over test or under test. The trick is to do things at just the right level so that you get enough test in. And that's why the space environments is a serious issue for spacecraft. I'd like to propose this approach to you. You can use this figure if you want in, in the future. I start with defining the environments. Those are on the left over there. Everything from the neutral atmosphere to space debris, galactic cosmic rays, et cetera. And across the top, I've, I've listed most of the major space environment effects, as you can see. And then I, for a given mission, in this case, for the Europa mission, Pluto Express, and for Solar Probe, I've listed where the main environments are and what the main interactions are. And I suggest that you do this for every mission you work on. To find the environment, then go across and figure out which interactions are important. Ultimately, what we will do is we will work with the interactions and try to figure out design options to help uh, prevent those effects having a role. And then the middle one column, you can see the various design options that I consider. And <coughs> different what? Somebody say something. No, go ahead. Anyway, the third step is given that you have these design options, you have to trade those off against various usability factors, such as cost, weight, power, complexity, or special issues like for uh, uh, RTGs and RPSs, that would be radioactive uh, sources on the spacecraft. Um, 
whether you, you, you can get around uh, solar array radiation effects by flying an RTG. Unfortunately, the RTG comes, the radio isotope thermal generator comes with all kinds of safety issues for the environment and things of that nature. So, I very, you go ahead and you can rate those as I've done over here, and then you can decide which things you're going to do for a mission. So, I propose this approach today uh, for what we're going, you're going to hear about. I will be talking specifically about spacecraft charging and micrometeoroids and space debris uh, today, and we'll be looking at all the different ways we can mitigate those effects. So let's start first with space environments. I'm going to have to define a few terms for you up front. First of all, what's the fundamental fu unit of energy that we use? Well, there's ergs, what, what is grams per square centimeter, I'm sorry, grams centimeter squared per second squared. That's basically mass times velocity squared. Same thing for joules and electron volts. And what we typically talk about in this field is electron volts. And there's the relationship between the, the different units. You can see ergs versus joules. And you'll see me bounce back and forth. Typically, I'll use electron volts or ergs. So the fundamental units of energy absorption, that is for dose, which we'll mention briefly, are rads. One rad equals 100 ergs per gram of silicon. Rays are the becoming more standard unit. That's joules per kilogram. And so one, you can see one gray equals about 100 rads. Uh, next thing is the one quantity that you'll hear a lot about today is intensity or flux and or fluence. The, Flux is the number of particles per square centimeter per second per stair radian that impinges on your surface. And that doesn't that matter doesn't matter whether it's photons or whether it's uh, uh, micrometeoroids or whether it's electrons or protons. So the basic unit of flux there is defined. Here are some examples of particles per square centimeter per second per stair radian per keV. KeV is a thousand electron volts. Or for heavy ions, it's particles per square meter per second per stair radian per MeV per nucleon. So those are the different units I'll be talking about today. Whoops, too fast. Uh, the other thing I'm going to be discussing a lot about, particularly for the spacecraft charging and for the micrometeoroids, is so called distribution functions. In the case of electrons or protons, we usually talk about a Maxwell-Boltzmann plasma distribution. We'll have similar, similar types of distributions for uh, micrometeoroids and for space debris. And from the, from the um, plasma distribution function, you can derive the number density, the flux, and the energy density or the energy flux at the, at the next level down. You can see the equations for those. And I believe you know what number density is. Number flux, again, is particles per square centimeter per second per stair radian. Energy density is the energy flux, basic, it, it, the energy at a given volume. And energy flux is the amount of energy flowing through a surface. Now, in the case of spacecraft charging, I'm going to be defining two different types of temperatures. Uh, average temperature, which is called the energy density divided by the number density or the energy flux divided by the number flux. The two quantities are not necessarily related. They're only related for a single Maxwellian distribution. For more complicated functions, they tend not to agree with each other. Now, on the lower right, here are some examples of distribution functions. The one on the left is for electrons. You can see across the bottom, we have electron distribution versus the distribution function. And the distribution function has weird units seconds cubed kilometers to the sixth. That's because you're going to integrate the distribution function over what's called space, phase space density, which is the, the velocity cubed. And that, so that's what the units are of that. You can see the uh, same thing for the protons on the right. Now, what I'm showing there is a single Maxwellian fit. That's the dashed line. The dotted line is a two Maxwellian fit. And the data is shown as a solid line. And obviously, uh, 
four terms, namely the number density and temperature, and for two different components will fit better than a single Maxwellian. So for the Maxwellian, again, to repeat, you have the number density and you have the temperature or energy as sort of the upper left that defines the distribution of particles. We will be showing these distribution functions a number of times through the course of the lecture. Oops, the light keeps jumping to the pages. Uh, this is the same type of same type of thing. In this case, wavelength st stands for energy, and the radius stands for the uh, distribution function. And this is for the sun. On the left, we see what the uh, dis the flux uh, solar flux at the Earth is. And then we see what happens when it goes through the atmosphere. And you can see the various absorption bands and such. On the right is the actual raw solar flux from extending from the extreme ultraviolet all the way up and to the radio waves on the right there. So these are the types of distribution functions we'll be discussing. Now, the first. Once you've defined the sunlight coming from the earth, falling on the earth, you get back to what the other thing the sun emits, emits what's called solar wind environment. And this is the solar wind environment, the upper left is looking down on the sun. The sun, as you can see, turns in a counterclockwise direction. And in the equatorial plane, the, helium, the equatorial plane of the sun, you'll get these var various uh, regions it turns out that the sun turns in, turns in about 27 days. Actually, it turns differently at the polar cap than it does at the equator. But that's why you see the, the uh, what we call garden hose pattern. If you look at the sun from the side, you can see that because of the magnetic field on the sun, we have a very different environment along the equator than we do along the polar caps. And then finally, the sun interacts with interstellar medium. And you can see where Voyager one and two are. They're, they've just now crossed out into the heliopause, out of the heliopause, and are now in interstellar space. And you can see that there's what we call a termination shock, where the solar wind intera interacts with the interstellar wind. And but the upper right are some of the parameters defining the solar wind. And again, you can use the uh, velocity. Or you can use the temperature, and given in the temperature. You can do those multiplied by the number density with a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution to reconstruct what the uh, distribution looks like of solar wind particles. The velocity, however, can vary from 200 to 2,500 or more kilometers per second. When it's 2,500 kilometers per second, we're going to have typically we'll have storms at the Earth. More importantly, though, is the magnetic field of the sun that goes outwards from the sun. Uh, that's what's shown on the left over there. That's the field lines, those, those spiral angles, so those field lines of the magnetic field. And it basically uh, lays roughly in the magnetic, in the equatorial plane. There is a north-south component to it, and the north-south component determines whether the magnetic field of the Earth interacts with the solar wind or not. If it's northward, because of the direction the, the Earth points, which we'll be seeing a little bit, it doesn't interact. If it points southward, then they they merge, and you can pump energy into the Earth's magnetic field. So that's the solar wind. That whoops, I don't know why it's jumping to. This is the Earth, and on the left you can see the magnetic field, or, or what's called the, the magneto sheath and magnetosphere of the Earth. Magneto sheath is the where the solar wind plasma interacts with the Earth magnetic field in its plasma. It's just basically like a shock in front of the Earth. You can see the various regions that we'll be discussing today. The main regions that we're concerned with for the uh, spacecraft charging is the plasma sphere and the plasma sheet. The plasma sphere is that inner region. Uh, if you look carefully on the field, trapped field lines, for the magnetic field of the Earth, and those that region is is basically dominated by the ionosphere of the Earth. Then if you look to the right, you'll see that the plasma sheet uh, region lays over that. The plasma sheet is very hot plasma that extends 
well out into the plasma tail. And that's what gives us most of our spacecraft charging. Temp typical temperatures are there are on about 10 to 20 kilo electron volts, whereas the plasma, it's, uh, the plasma sphere is typically on a few electron volts or less. And then uh, if you see the polar region up there, that's pretty much devoid of particles until there's a solar proton event on the sun. And then the, the charged particles from protons primarily can come in along the field lines from the tail of the Earth. They, don't, they, they can come in where you see the uh, polar region overlapping with the uh, plasma sheet there at, at the nose. They can come in there or they have to come all the way up from the tail of the Earth. This, which is a surprise to most people that they come from the tail of the Earth and flood the polar caps. Then also shown is the Van Allen radiation belts. The Van Allen radiation belts, the high energy million electron volts and higher, will contribute to the internal electrostatic discharge processes that we'll be discussing today. I've also included, and I'll discuss these at a later time in another, in, in another uh, segment of the course, the ionosphere of the Earth and the atmosphere. The ionosphere primarily drives uh, plasma interactions in the, low, in the uh, in lower Earth orbit, whereas the atmosphere, of course, primarily leads to drag and atomic oxygen erosion. And again, the, ones, the atmospheric effects will be discussed at a later time. I'm also, as because of the internal electrostatic discharge, which we'll discuss shortly, uh, the planetary radiation environments are important for all the planets. Not only do they affect radiation damage, but these are the models. Um, I, I think I'm the only person that's produced all the different radiation models. Uh, the, uh, they're available online at JPL. Uh, if you need them, email me and I'll be glad to send you the contact points where you can run the online programs for all the different planets to determine the radiation. We will need these radiation environments, particularly at Earth and at Jupiter, to define the internal electrostatic discharge effects that are, that are critical to those two environments. Anyway, this is just to give you a taste of what's coming. Uh, this is an old chart. It's it's probably changed a bit uh, since then, since there have been lots more failures. But back in 1998, the Aerospace Corporation rated all the different types of effects that led to satellite failures. Surprisingly, electrostatic discharge, in particular internal electrostatic discharge, was the main killer of satellites not radiation effects, because people typically know about radiation effects and they protect for those. As we'll see, people didn't realize in the early decades of the space program that spacecraft charging was significant. And as a result of that, it became the main killer of satellites. You can see down here the different types of radiation effects, micrometeoroids and such. On the right, I've listed a few, and we'll see this again in more detail, some of the satellites that have been damaged or lost due to space environment effects. So anyway, that's to give you a feel for why we're talking about spacecraft charging in particular today and why uh, micrometeor effects are important. Now, let me give you an example of why we're interested in spacecraft charging. The DISCUS satellites, the main communication satellites for the Department of Defense, started having problems. In fact, one of the satellites was lost. And when they did the error analysis, they found out that it was, and I'll show you another couple of pictures in a minute why we found that, why we believe this, it was due to spacecraft charging. And here's what happened. And this is a chain of events that happens many, many times on spacecraft. And I want you to keep this in mind whenever you're working on a spacecraft. First thing that happens is the environmental engineer specifies something. All solar ray, <coughs> ray cables should be grounded to the spacecraft. That's so you don't build up differential charge and lead to an arc. Well, the designer said bolt the coaxial cable shield to the spacecraft ground, all right? I think you can understand that there's a there's a cable around grounding cable around the outside of most cables that you can uh, ground to this spacecraft bus. Mechanical engineer 
<clears throat> drill the hole into the spacecraft chassis, bolt down the wire. Now here's where things go to pieces. Use Loctite so it doesn't come loose. The mechanical engineer is only worried about vibration effects and mechanical effects on things. So he doesn't did not realize that putting Loctite on the uh, bolts would insulate them from the spacecraft ground. And so they put lots of Loctite on the bolts on, to make sure they nearly didn't come loose. And they actually created a case where the coaxial cable was not grounded to the spacecraft, led, led to arcing and lost the spacecraft. So the moral is this, don't assume everyone understands your requirements. Always, always verify. The space environment person and the designers should go around to the engineers building it and remind them of why they asked that be done. So mistakes, it could be your purpose in life is only to serve as a warning to others. Now, this is why we think it was spacecraft charging. On the left is a European satellite and they uh, plotted at geosynchronous orbit, they plotted whenever they saw uh, upsets on the spacecraft. And it turns out they were all located shortly after midnight. Now, why after midnight? Well, that turns out to be the region where the space pl the uh, plasma sheet of the Earth intersects with the satellite orbit during geomagnetic storms. And basically, the, as we'll see on the right figure, the temperature of the plasma can go from a few kilovolt electron volts, a few thousand electron volts, up to tens to hundreds of thousands of electron volts. And therefore, the electrons build up on the spacecraft and they lead to arcing. Now, on the right, uh, we have what's called a spectrogram plot. And you'll see a couple of these throughout the rest of the presentation. Now, the way the spectrogram plot works is this. Along the bottom is time. Um, on the left side, uh, since the cold electrons and cold protons do the same thing, we usually plot the zero energy in the middle. You can see, as a function of brightness, how many particles there are as a function of energy. That's energy on the left scale, increasing for electrons to the top, increasing to the bottom for protons. What you see is initially uh, 10, about 10 EV, you can see the photoelectrons coming off the surface of the spacecraft. If you go up to around 10 keV, you can see that the, so the material was roughly running about two or three keV, the electrons. If you go down, you can see that the protons were up around 10,000 or more uh, keV. And it turns out that the electrons move about 50 times faster than the uh, protons because they have roughly the same energy, you go one half mv squared for an electron versus one half mv squared for a proton, and you find that because of the electron is so much smaller than the proton, that it travels about 40 to 50 times faster. One half mv squared equals one half mv squared, where m is really low for electrons and really high for protons. So the electrons will stack up on a surface unless in this particular case on the left, the photoelectrons emitted from the surface shorted out. There are more photoelectrons leaving the surface than there are electrons coming in. So it tend, generally things tend to go a little bit positive. All right, I've, I've indicated in yellow, since you can't see it real well in this spectrogram, where the uh, uh, protons were. At about uh, 21, 2130 hours, you can see a red line that calls plasma injection. At that point, a geomagnetic storm occurred near midnight and the electron energy went way up. Now, initially, the photo, you can see the photoelectrons go away because the surface is starting to charge negatively. You can see that the, elect the charge in the spacecraft went from a few, a few volts negative, say around 20 or 30. It went up to about a kilovolt uh, at the, in the, during the plasma injection while the spacecraft was in sunlight. Promptly at about 2245, the spacecraft went into the Earth's shadow. The photoelectrons went away. So it's during solar eclipse, the spacecraft had no photoelectrons and the electrons drove the spacecraft potential negative to minus 10,000 volts. 
it only takes about 200 volts, 100 to 200 volts, to cause an arc discharge on the surface of the spacecraft. So you can see what happens. The spacecraft surface starts to arc. Then at about 2200 hours, we left the eclipse, and you can see that the uh, photoelectrons came back and the potential started to drop back down to lower levels. So that's the basic process. That's why we decided that it was probably spacecraft charging, because that's when the discus era occurred, was in uh, eclipse passage. So that's the basic process. Now, when we plotted up the temperature of the electrons versus the potential of the uh, in eclipse, you get this following relationship. You can see that it's directly related to the temperature. Now, if you notice, it doesn't go through zero. It goes through uh, about 2 keV, which is sort of the background plasma sheet temperature. But you can see there's definitely a correlation between satellite potential in eclipse and the uh, temperature of the plasma. Notice that I've done it in terms of the average in the RMS since they don't agree. Now, these are the basic equations that can tell you how high your potential is going to be on your spacecraft. The first and most basic one is current balance. Now, what we say here is that the total current to the spacecraft as a function of voltage is equal to the ambient electron current, the uh, minus the various uh, positive currents. The first is the ion current itself. The next one is the secondary electrons that are knocked off the surface from by the incoming electrons. The second, the third term, are the secondary secondary electrons knocked off by the incoming ions. And if, then there's what's called backscattered electrons. These are electrons that come in at high energy and bounce off at high energy. And finally, the one the, the dominant term typically is the photoelectrons. Each of those is a proportional to as affected by uh, the potential in the spacecraft. So the, the total is the electron current coming in minus all these, you could call them return currents or, or uh, currents that reduce the potential of the negative flux to the spacecraft. We'll look at Poisson's equation in just a second. That, that tells you what's going on in the space around the spacecraft. And ultimately, all plasma physics has to use the time independent Boltzmann equation. We won't be using that much today, but uh, I wanted to show it to you anyway, because the fancy programs actually use that equation. So those are the three basic equations that we use to determine spacecraft charging, whether it's surface or internal. Now here's for surface charging, what we think is going on. I've removed all the except for photoelectrons and ambient ion currents, since they dominate. Uh, I've removed the others so you can see the, a very simple equation for them. The electron current coming to the satellite is balanced ultimately by the photoelectrons and now heavy ions coming into the spacecraft. You can see the electrons come in, the ions come in, and the photoelectrons leave. On the right is the, basically an I, IV curve for a spacecraft or for a probe, it doesn't matter. And in this particular case, it's for a plate. If I take an a plate, put it in a plasma, and then crank up and down the voltage, uh, I will first on the left, you can see, if it's, if it's uh, <clears throat> uh, negatively charged, uh, the ions will be sucked in. And ion current, again, is shown as dot line, is much lower than the electron current. So as you slowly decrease the, uh, the, decrease the current, you can see that at some point, the ion current and the electron current balance. That's where the satellite potential will be. And then as you continue to drop the, uh, and drop the voltage over here, as it goes more and more negative, you can see that the um, electron current uh, drops down to go to very high values. And as the voltage goes positive, you can see that it sucks in more electrons. So the current is the vertical, the voltage is the horizontal. And as you decrease from negative voltages, you can see towards positive voltage that the electrons totally dominate down here, a factor of roughly 40 to one. 
And so the point at which the two currents balance, that's the potential at which the spacecraft will the spacecraft will balance. Now let's go to the Defy length issue. Now this is called the uh, thin sheath, I'm sorry, thick sheath uh, high density plasma case. If you take two plates, put them in a vacuum tube, and you turn on the voltage uh, so that it's positive you, from the uh, cathode, you'll, ex you'll extract electrons. The electrons run towards the positive anode over here, where it's positive. And, but as they go, since there are a lot of them, they pile up on, this, on the uh, plate. And in their passage to that plate, they tend to shield each other. So in reality, what happens is that the electrons piling up on the plate shield the incoming electrons. The distance over which that's called is very important to spacecraft charging. It's called the Debye length. Uh, if you solve the uh, uh, Solk equation that we showed earlier, uh, you'll get the following results. The, the potential is equal to the charge times the exponential minus the distance to the plate over uh, the Debye length over R. Q over R would be the normal fall off of the voltage uh, with distance from a charged plate. But because you have this enhanced uh, electron environment next to the plate, it shields it. And that shielding length is called the Debye length. And it's equal, proportional to the t square root of the temperature and the number density is on the right there. And at low, at low earth altitude, below about five or 600 kilometers, as we'll see shortly, the uh, density is enough that the electron density is high enough that the by length becomes very important. And the by length can be on the order of centimeters at space station altitudes sometimes, more likely meters, but uh, it becomes extremely important for the space station and for LEO orbit. And so the Debye length determines how the spacecraft will charge because the particles don't really see the spacecraft till they're very close to it. The cross section of the spacecraft becomes the do dominant uh, feature as you're running through the plasma, uh, that you intercept the plasma, and that's the uh, amount of electrons that you're going to see. Well, I call that the 1D case or the thin sheath, I mean, sorry, the thick sheath case. Now, at the other extreme, at geosynchronous orbit, there are very few particles and not many electrons or anything except for photoelectrons. But if we turn off the photoelectrons, what happens is spacecraft, because the electrons still tend to dominate the ions, will slowly build up on the surface of the spacecraft and, and char charge it negative or positive. You can see here that the spacecraft is, is charging positive, and as a, as a result of that, it absorbs the electrons. And you can reverse that situation, and you get the opposite for the uh, protons. If the spacecraft is charged positive, it sucks in the electrons, as shown here. If it's negatively charged, it sucks in the protons and repels the electrons. But the big thing that we're worried about is what does the cross section of the spacecraft look like to the ambient plasma? Well, we can we can determine that by the following physics. We take energy conservation. In other words, the kinetic energy of the particle outside the uh, away from the spacecraft is one half mv squared, v naught squared. As the space as the particle approaches the spacecraft, it falls through a potential qv on the right there. And by energy conservation, the kinetic energy of the particle has to go up. So we have the original kinetic energy plus the kinetic energy that, that it gains and plus the potential that it gains and falling through the potential to the spacecraft. Angular momentum has to be maintained in all cases. And as you can see, the particles are coming in with, with a curved trajectory. So the angular momentum and in the ionosphere or in the ambient plasma is mr v naught 
and at the spacecraft, it's MRV, where V is the spacecraft velocity. So at RF. So those two things have to be maintained. If you solve that, those two equations, you come out that the interaction, that's the region from which it's sucking in electrons, goes as radius of the satellite times one minus the potential energy over the kinetic energy of the particles, the square root. So just take those two equations, solve them, and you get what's called the impact parameter. The, that becomes important, as we'll see in the next slide, because it determines how many electrons or ions you're sucking in. Now, the Q is positive or negative. V is whatever the spacecraft potential has. So you can see that as Q changes, you either add or subtract to the impact parameter for that given species. So the current density of spacecraft, then, is given by the current to the spacecraft divided by 4 pi r radius of spacecraft squared. And if you take that and insert the uh, rs value for rs up here, you can see that you get the, uh, you get the following equation on the right. And so that says that the current, if the spacecraft is charged, uh, is electrons, and the spacecraft is charged positive, you can see that it's that get makes a uh, minus sign. If you see that the Q is positive and V is negative, then you get a positive also. So that's the, that tells you how, whether you're attracting or subtracting uh, current from the ambient plasma. This is the thick sheath orbit limited current solution. I call this my 3D solution. Now, this gets hairy. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I want to illustrate it for you. If we assume that the plasma distribution is a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, as shown in the upper left, we can use Louisville's theorem. Louisville's theorem is very simple. It's not tricky at all. All it's saying is that if we have X number of particles at this point in space, and we follow that group of particles, you're going to have the same number of particles at y at, a, at another point. However, they may have fallen through a potential or they may be repelled or things like that. And that means that their energy is changing, but the number density at the, at the changed energy is equal to the number density at the original energy. And again, by energy conservation, we put that down. And then these imply that for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, that the, that the distribution function is equal to the uh, distribution at the satellite times the distribution in the ambient space over there uh, times Q, QV over KT. So the sign is for plus or minus for electrons or minus for ions, okay? And the uh, maximum, well, Velocity is either zero, because if you if it's uh, if it's repelled, it's going to go to zero, and the q two q v over m is the momentum of the particle. I'm sorry, the uh, yeah the inner, the one half m v squared. That's the velocity. I'm sorry, that's the velocity is equal to that. Coming down to the bottom, we. If we integrate all this with those equations I showed you at the beginning to get the current, the uh, four moments of the distribution function, one of them is the current, you get the following relationships. You get for electrons that electrons um, are, f uh, uh, are repelled species. You get EQV over KT, exponential QV over KT, whereas at the bottom equation, the particles are, the particles are attracted, and that's the attracted species, and so the current goes up to the spacecraft. Vice versa for the ions or protons. The top curve is the, it shows you what happens there in the repelled species. Now, here's what we're going to do. We can take and do current balance, 
the current balance equation says that the ambient ions are going to be uh, extracted by the spacecraft. The ambient electrons are going to be repelled by the spacecraft. And so if we go back to these equations and we take the appropriate terms, you can get you can get the uh, you can get those two equations. Now, typically a geosynchronous orbit, the uh, temperature is going to be uh, going to be a little bit higher than the voltage on the spacecraft. So we usually we can make that approximation go to zero in the equation. For current balance, we have to have that the J total equals zero. So if you solve the upper equation, wiping out the QV over KTI, you get to this equation. That says that the voltage is proportional to the temperature over the charge to the logarithm of the currents. Now, sometimes the temperature is going to dominate, but believe it or not, sometimes the electron current dominates. So both those terms are important. And if you remember what I was saying, back here is that you get the relationship that the temperature is proportional to the potential. And that's where that comes from. That's a very simple little equation as a rule of thumb that you can use to calculate the potential in a spacecraft. But you need both the current of the electrons and ions and the temperatures, not just the temperature. Now, using that equation and including the backscatter and secondary emission terms and assuming a point in space, you can predict the potential on the spacecraft. I've done that here on the ATS-5 and ATS-6 spacecraft. And you can see that it does a fairly good job of fitting, giving the observed potential versus the predicted potential. But this is in eclipse. I want to stress that this is in eclipse. Now, on the right, the uh, ATS-5 and ATS-6 estimates, I also went and used what's called the geomagnetic index KP. And this tells you if there's a geomagnetic storm going on, particularly at geosynchronous orbit. And so when the geomagnetic activity goes up, the potential in the spacecraft can go up when it's near local midnight and typically in eclipse. These are the potentials in eclipse as given by the KP index. And again, the error bars are very large, but the bottom line is that increased geomagnetic activity increases the surface potential in the spacecraft significantly. That's the point, that's what we call surface charging. Now, uh, you can even go one step further. As the sun goes behind the Earth and the satellite goes into eclipse, you can plot the potentials, and that's the two uh, diagrams on the left are plots of the uh, spacecraft potential uh, versus time. And those plot, the little air bar, the bars are my guesses based on my simple model of point of current balance at a point. And you, on the right is the actual how the atmosphere is changing and affecting the, the wavelength and stuff of the eclipse for, of the sun. And use that to calculate on the right the photoelectron current. So as the photoelectron current decreases as you go into eclipse, the potential goes up. And as it goes out, vice versa, the potential goes down. And as you can see from current balance, you get a pretty damn good fit to the uh, potential on the spacecraft, a very simple model. Now, people have extended that model ad nauseum to where each point on the surface of the spacecraft is, is measured what the current to that point is, and then how each of those surfaces is connected by inductors, or resistors, or capacitors to other surfaces on the spacecraft. And from that, you can actually calculate the time variations on each surface on the spacecraft. We're going to see that in a moment in the uh, NASCAP movie, how they carry that out in detail. So keep that in mind, that each surface that's, that ha is electrically connected on the surface to other surfaces is going to build up a potential different than those other surfaces, depending on how it's connected with capacitances, inductors, etc. Now, using that model and extending it as far as we can, the 1D case you know, on the right over here, you'll see sunlight and eclipse. 1D stands for the thick, thin, thick sheath, uh, very small uh, 
uh, uh, radius uh, region from which you draw particles. So we're basically looking at a, a surface ramming into the plasma. The ram is actually takes into account the ion ram current, and 3D is the what is the thick sheath approximation. Now what I've done is for various regions throughout space, I've calculated the characteristic. Uh, ion energy and electron energy, and I've actually computed the different ion species. I've calculated the Debye length. You can see that the Debye length is typically very short, except for geosynchronous orbit and high latitudes, and therefore the 1D or RAM case is probably more appropriate. Jupiter, same thing, and also I've done it for the solar wind, the plasma sheet, and outer magnetosphere. Now I've marked in pink the color, the or light red, the, the values that I think are most appropriate. You can see for Venus, the uh, ram, uh, ram current might be important at 1500 kilometers. And you can see the potentials, however, in sunlight or eclipse are very, very low. If we go to the Earth, almost all the values are very, are very high, are very low in the ionosphere and up to about 3.5 Earth radiuses. And only at geosynchronous orbit and in high latitude occasionally do you get very high potentials. We'll come back to that later. But so the 3D case is most appropriate at high latitudes, I'm sorry, at uh, large distances. Same thing for Jupiter down here. And you can see again, it reaches up to 2,500 uh, volts in the outer magnetosphere. Solar wind typically is only about 100 volts. We have actually seen 100 volts in this negative in the solar wind. These values are all pretty much uh, actually what you would see. And these are all based on that simple little current balance model. Now, there's one wrinkle that's very critical. This again is a spectrogram, the same as we saw at the beginning, except you can see funny bite out over there um, and, and the electrons. And you can see what looks like a wavy pattern in the protons near the middle of the graph. Here's what's happening. If you look in the lower right, uh, the sensor on this spacecraft was recessed. Sunlight would shine on the edge of the, of the cavity where it was recessed and would, it would emit photoelectrons. Electrons and ions would try to come in. And unfortunately, you had this cloud of electrons there, and that would drive the uh, drive the surface on the left positive and the surface on the that other side would try to go negative. Now, this satellite was oscillating. ATS-5 was a spinner. And so it would go in and out of eclipse. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing a secondary cloud of photoelectrons emitted and not emitted. And that causes the wavy pattern in the ions and it causes the bite out in the electrons over there. So. We didn't actually go into eclipse here, except for the instrument itself went into eclipse. This is called differential charging, and is a very good illustration of how different surfaces in the spacecraft can charge to very different voltages. Now, here's a, here's a very sim two simple examples of that. On the left, if you assume the spacecraft is an insulating surface, and the front surface emits photoelectrons, and the back surface is uh, in the shadow, you can get a dipole. That's the dipole down at the bottom there, the formula for a dipole. The result of that, those are the potential values of, for the satellite. And you can see there's a saddle point in front of the satellite that plasma can be trapped. On the right over there, we're showing from, from NASCAP, we're showing an electron beam being emitted, and that trapped cloud will reflect the, the will, will reflect the beam of electrons. And this is actually what was observed on SCAFA, the satellite we're going to talk about, which was intended to study spacecraft charging. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at SCAFA, Spacecraft Charging High Altitude Satellite, P78-2. I was a project scientist on that. And the mission objectives were to define the ambient environment, measure satellite sheath and potentials. You can see all the different booms out there. They actually measured the gradient in the uh, plasma cloud around the spacecraft. And the study arcing, we had arc detectors all over the spacecraft, and we wanted to validate the NASCAP code. 
And we wanted to see if we could actually control the charging of the spacecraft by emitting ion beams, uh, neutral beams, and electron beams. It turns out that the only thing that worked was neutral beams, as we'll see. So uh, this is the NASCAP code. I want to listen to this. 78 developed under the joint NASA Air Force spacecraft charging technology program. This is the NASCAP computer model of the SCAVA spacecraft. It has a central cylindrical body with four long booms sticking out and several scientific instruments. The SCAVA satellite was designed to study spacecraft charging. Orbiting spacecraft always build up electric charges simply from being in space. Depending on the space environment, this may or may not cause problems. If the charging gets severe enough to cause spontaneous electric discharge, satellite operations can be interrupted. A spacecraft is surrounded by electric and magnetic and it is constantly bombarded from all directions by charged space particles. These space particles, electrons and ions, shower the entire spacecraft's surface. At certain locations, SCAVA has particle detectors to count the incoming particles. SCAVA also carries particle emitters, field sensing devices, and material charging monitors. The particle detector illustrated here can rotate to sense particles from various directions. It is these particles, landing on the spacecraft, that cause spacecraft charging. In a quiet environment, such as this, charging problems are minimal. In an extreme environment, the ions and electrons become much more energetic and can cause costly discharges. To illustrate electric potential, we pass an imaginary plane through the spacecraft and draw contour lines around it. This line marks an area of equal electric potential in space. These potentials are shown in volts. The line farthest out shows a potential of minus 2 volts. The one right next to the spacecraft is at minus 7 volts. Where the lines are close together is where the electric fields are the greatest. The peak value is the largest potential. This is at the satellite surface. This is the potential difference between adjacent contour lines. We move the imaginary plane up and down to show you the potentials all around the spacecraft. The sophisticated SCAVA experiments are constantly monitoring the electric potentials, both on the spacecraft and in the surrounding space. In a moment, we will show you a sudden change from quiet environment to substorm environments. This will cause a rapid accumulation of charge on the spacecraft. As the charge increases, the contour lines will appear to multiply and explode outwards. Step values will quickly increase by three orders of magnitude. Here it comes. During the substorm, charging occurs in two separate phases. In the first phase, potentials increase suddenly to several thousand volts. But in this phase, the contours still have the same shape. They follow the boom outlines, and no discharge occurs. The second phase lasts longer and results in discharge. The contour lines close up. They don't follow the boom outlines any. Any regular electric. The field strength increases until this is the disruptive discharge. Charging resumes, leading to another discharge. And another interrupting satellite communications. discharge is at best a nuisance. At worst, it can permanently damage sensitive electronic systems. The satellite is now in a highly charged state, 
as it might be just before a discharge. Each part of the satellite has its own unique charging characteristics. The right and left beam tips, for example, are charged up to minus 9,000 volts, while the bottom boom tip is at only 3,000 volts negative. The physics of this complicated process would be impossible to understand without high-speed computers and the advanced programming techniques of NASCAP. Research scientists have developed several techniques to control spacecraft charging, such as the onboard electron gun. With this device, negative charge is simply shot out into space, which makes the spacecraft potential more positive. At first, the beam widens and more and more electrons are pulled back until a steady state is reached and a fixed percentage of electrons escape. The electrons form a cloud around the spacecraft, once again changing the spacecraft environment. This is just one of the innovative techniques being developed by the Air Force and NASA to improve the reliability now whoops no oh, why keeps jumping anyway this is the actual picture of p78-2 and down on the left you can see all the different material surfaces that were modeled and the right is the nascap model of the spacecraft and you can see the uh, is modeled by lots of little cubies and rods each of those the rods for example have their own unique uh, uh, iv curve and each of the surfaces has its own also and so for each surface, you put you basically calculate the, the current versus voltage, and then you add all those together, depending on how they're connected electro electrically, and you can calculate all the different potentials on the spacecraft. This is some of the results that we found. First of all, as to observations, we found that if you look, you're looking down at the Earth, uh, SCAFA was not in a perfect geo. It was deliberately put into a four to eight uh, our Earth radius orbit so that we could see how things varied with uh, uh, both radius and with local time. This is looking down on from uh, the polar cap, and you can see things are plotted in local times. The curious thing here is, as we would expect, both surface potentials, which are plotted as the contours there, went up at near midnight and then died off as you go around towards noon. And there are a lot of arcs there. However, the, <laughs> there are a whole bunch of arcs around on the day side. That turns out, as we'll see shortly, to be due to internal electrostatic discharge. That's due to very high energy electrons. So anyway, this plot is was basically the fundamental plot that proves spacecraft charging for us using SCAFA. On the right is the SCAFA computations of two surfaces on the spacecraft. One was the uh, spacecraft potential, and the other was the flight data. The dots are the flight data. The NASCAP prediction is the actual uh, uh, model results. The interesting thing is this was a surface that was isolated, a Kapton surface, if I remember, isolated from the other parts of the spacecraft. And as the spacecraft spun in and out of sunlight, this is the potential that you would observe on the spacecraft. And they nailed it pretty much dead on. So the program works pretty well in many cases. The problem that you have <coughs> is not discussed, and I'll mention it only one time. The material properties change very dramatically with time on a spacecraft. They become contaminated. They become damaged by UV or radiation damage, uh, micrometeoroid make holes in them and things like that. And unfortunately, after a few years on orbit, the sp you don't, you're not really sure what the uh, surface features uh, are like anymore they, because they become contaminated or damaged. So that's a problem. But at least initially, you can do a good job of predicting what the spacecraft potentials will be and look at it for different uh, uh, cases. Now let's look at plasma interactions. This is the ionosphere. 
These are actual measurements from a spacecraft that uh, flew uh, uh, in the ionosphere. And these are at various altitudes. The height went from 500 kilometers up to 1,200 kilometers, as you can see on there. And this is Explorer 31. And what we measure here is the current when you're looking into the RAM direction, that's one. That, the, the ratio of the current as, you met, as the spacecraft goes around, there was a little boom on it, a little current detector. And you can see at low altitudes, there's a very deep wake behind the spacecraft as, as the plasma is shadowed. Uh, that, and you can see the percentage of hydrogen was like 10% uh, or less and mainly uh, heavy, heavy ions like oxygen, O plus. As we go to higher and higher altitudes, the weight starts to disappear. And you can see by the time you get down to uh, 1,200 kilometers, it's almost gone. And uh, where there is dominated by hydrogen. Protons obviously have a higher kinetic velocity than oxygen and other uh, subs uh, other ions, and so it can fill in the wake. And so you, at, you move from basically a one-dimensional model where what you see hitting you is what you get at low altitudes to basically three-dimensional uh, orbit limited capture for the current. So this validates what we were saying earlier. Now, that's all well and good, but there is a problem. At all the, most all the planets, even at Mars, they have been able to find aurora. And Venus has aurora, I think even Mercury does. Lately, they've discovered them. And the bottom line is that Jupiter and the Earth and Uranus and Neptune and Saturn all have very intense aurora. You can see the ones at Jupiter there. Uh, very intense auroras. By the way, I want you to note the little uh, circle thing on the left on Jupiter with a little bright tag going up. That turns out to be a V cross B effect of one of the, of the Io of the moon. We'll discuss that a little later also. But uh, you can see the aurora on the lower right. So the aurora are ever, pretty much everywhere. And aurora are basically beams of high energy particles that come down to, at, following geomagnetic storms along the magnetic field lines and hit the atmosphere and illuminate the atmosphere. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing uh, atmosphere being excited and beams of electrons and ions hitting, hitting the atmosphere. Whoops, dang it. Sorry, <laughs> it keeps bouncing. I don't know, I guess I hold it down too long. Anyway, this is the actual probability of seeing a bright aurora versus magnetic local time. That magnetic local time is based on where the dipole of the Earth is. It's, it's offset 11 degrees from the actual polar cap at the Earth. And this is the corrected geomagnetic latitude. And if you plot when you see aurora, they, they call, come primarily near midnight, the really intense aurora. And they're about a quarter of a percent of the time uh, so they're not not all that often as you can imagine, as you know. On the left, you can see uh, the percentage of the time plotted uh, when you would see an aurora uh, on the left, the map on the left. So this is the percentage of time we would see aurora near local midnight. And yes, again, they're so they're associated with the plasma injections at local midnight from the plasma sheet. That's the main source of these particles coming into the Earth. Now, let's look at what, what the concern is. If you just immerse a big flat plate, say the space station solar arrays into a ionospheric plasma, you're going about seven kilometers per second relative to the plasma. And the bottom line is that uh, you get a weight created. You can see here the, chart, the particles are on the left because everything's coming from the left in this particular plot. And the plate shields the stuff behind it. All right. Now, if you put a body in there, some of the particles will get through and charge it slightly. So the highest energy electrons, for example, uh, from going from the fusion will get in and uh, the ions can't get in. 
but electrons try to diffuse in those, particularly the very high energy ones. So you get a small potential well back there and it would be negative. Now, if you take and you put the thing in an aurora, what's gonna happen is the aurora, very high energy, 10, tens of, 10 keV or higher, they can penetrate into the space, into the wake region and charge a body. That body might be, as we'll see in a moment, an astronaut. So there's a real concern that when an astronaut is outside, he can go from regions where he's grounded by the cold plasma of the ionosphere to regions where high energy particles, such as from the aurora, can charge him up. And why do we say that? Because the space station goes up to about four, about 50 or 60 degrees uh, latitude, and that's because the 11 and a half degree tilt, you can get the aurora coming down uh, to the, where the astronaut is. Now on the right, we can even do, we can do strange things. We can bias uh, a body relative to the plate, and you can get really intense charging in the wake of a shuttle or or the space station, things like that. We've actually done these experiments. And uh, it's important to know that the plasma generally keeps you at low potentials, but if you're running through uh, potential, if you're running into an eclipse or if you're being eclipsed by the uh, plate in front of you, you can build up very high potentials. And that's illustrated here. This is a typical aurora. And this is from the DMSP satellite. As you can see on the right, that's the actual picture the DMSP was taking. You can see where the bright, really bright aurora arc is near midnight. And you know, the, the yellow path on, on the right is the yellow on the left over there, the aurora arc. And you can see the potential in the satellite went up even for a low altitude, 800 kilometer polar orbiting satellite, went up to almost a thousand volts, and the electron currents, because of the aurora, shot up to 5, 10 keV. So what you're seeing is an auroral arc. You're flying through the auroral arc. On the, you can see that on the right, and you can see then the potential of the spacecraft goes way up. That's the concern. Astronaut out in an aurora. This is actual calculations using NASCAP of the charging potential of an astronaut. And uh, if you believe it, he can get up to a couple thousand volts. And if he takes his hand, which is down around a, a thousand volts, and touches his nose, which is a plexic, plastic uh, surface and therefore charges significantly, he can get an arc. <laughs> Just like walking across the hard carpet and touching your nose. So that's the, that's the effects of this. Now, another movie, this is gonna show you what happens when the space arrays GX plasma. Satellites designed and manufactured by Space Systems Loral are impressive spacecraft carrying powerful payloads capable of relaying hundreds of megabits every second. The satellites are designed to have an on-orbit life exceeding 15 years. All the while, their payloads continuously draw eight to 9,000 watts of direct current to power these satellites, SSL has developed a design that includes a two-wing solar array configuration. Each wing currently is made up of four panels carrying 20 circuits of solar cells. So a typical panel holds five circuits. A solar cell can be made of either gallium arsenide or silicon. Each cell is covered with a thin protective layer of glass. The solar array is a DC power source maintained at a regulated voltage of 100 volts. And each solar array circuit generates two to three amps of current. Within the past year, analysis of orbital telemetry data from five recently launched spacecraft have indicated that a partial loss of electrical power occurred in two of those satellites. A minor loss in a third satellite is believed to be unrelated. It was first observed that the failure occurrences happened in conjunction with solar substorm activity, commonly called solar flares. No failures have happened when the sun has been quiet. The two spacecraft affected have gallium arsenide solar cells, 
while the other three spacecraft utilize silicon cells. However, because there are many other differences in manufacture of the two types of arrays, a difference between the cell materials may not be significant. To analyze the problem further, Loral engineers ran a series of system tests and simulations on the ground. Together with spacecraft telemetry, these isolated the failure site to the solar array itself and ruled out any other cause. Space Systems Loral then engaged Maxwell Labs to perform a spacecraft charging analysis using the NASCAP computer code and to seek physical models that would explain the failure mechanism. The following failure scenario was developed. Basically, a solar flare bathes the satellite in electrons and the entire spacecraft is charged negative. However, because of photoemission, the solar cell cover glasses charge less negative relative to the body of the spacecraft. This results in a voltage difference of a few hundred volts from the cover glass to the cell, causing a small arc discharge. This arc is confined to a local area and does no damage. However, this triggering arc does produce localized high-density plasma in the gap next to the cell. If the voltage differential between adjacent cells is greater than a threshold value, current can be drawn from the solar array itself into the plasma, sustaining the arc at a much higher current density. The overall design of the solar array is such that there can be a differential voltage across the gap between adjacent cells of up to 80 volts on gallium arsenide arrays and up to 75 volts on the silicon arrays. If the arc persists, localized heating can burn or pyrolyze the insulating kapton, which separates the cell from the carbon fiber substrate, leaving a carbon path in the kapton layer. This can cause a permanent string short circuit between cells and from cell to substrate. Utilizing NASA Lewis facilities to simulate the space environment, SSL devised a test to induce this failure mode in solar array samples called coupons. The NASA Lewis testing confirmed that with the original cell design, the threshold for sustaining the arc was 60 volts or higher. SSL engineers have been unable to induce arcs at less than 60 volts. Based on the thorough analysis provided by Maxwell Labs and the extensive charging testing performed at NASA Lewis, Space Systems Loral has adopted three important design changes which are being applied to all unlaunched spacecraft using 100 volt buses. First, the design of string layouts on solar array panels has been revised to limit adjacent cell voltage differential to 50 volts or less. Second, an RTV insulating barrier is being added between cells to cover all exposed kapton, including kapton in the high field region between rows of cells. This insulation barrier will eliminate arcs from occurring in the high field region and will significantly increase the threshold for sustained arcs, thus eliminating the damaging arcs which burn the kapton. Either one of these first two design changes by itself is sufficient to prevent the problem. The combination of the two provides even higher assurance. In fact, the demonstrated margins are far higher than the margin of safety on the 42-volt arrays that SSL has been flying for nearly 20 years. Finally, to provide even greater assurance, isolating diodes have been added to limit the current available to an arc to that from a single string only, rather than the two or three strings that were previously combined into a single circuit. This three-pronged solution was subsequently tested to verify its veracity with both gallium arsenide and silicon coupons. Working with NASA Lewis engineers, Loral engineers determined that gallium arsenide coupons with the RTV barrier tested without failure up to 120 volts. Sensitive instrumentation demonstrates that there is no current drawn from the array into the arc below this value. Silicon coupons tested without failure to 180 volts. These test results with the RTV added combined with the revised string layout providing a maximum circuit voltage difference of no more than 50 volts means that the satellite will be able to withstand the worst solar flares and continue to provide excellent service for their entire lifespans.
Quickly tracking down and eradicating this anomaly has been a priority for Space Systems L'Oreal. In fact, the work performed by SSL, Maxwell Labs, NASA Lewis, and other partners has significantly added to the body of knowledge of spacecraft interaction with the space environment. With commercial spacecraft electrical power requirements doubling every five years, this knowledge will allow SSL and the rest of the commercial space industry to continue to provide reliable operations. Space can be a harsh and unforgiving environment. Space Systems L'Oreal is committed to providing the most reliable satellites to its customers. And Space Systems L'Oreal is pleased to have found and verified this solution. Did that come through all right? Ken, did you hear that pretty well? Uh, yes, yes. All right. How are you? Gary, is good? All right. This one's being. Now, here's what's going on. And I want to stre stress that this is a <laughs> really weird effect. This is called a snapover. What, what basically what's happening is if you look at the middle of the middle of the picture on the left, you can see the side cross section of a set of solar uh, cells. And you can see that typically what they do to save weight is they just connect them with wires that are exposed and they don't put grouting like these people were talking about in between them. And it's because it saves a lot of mass. Anyway, to make a long story short, if you bias that wire in between the two solar arrays, the cells, to the solar cells, and you scan over the surface. If you look down at the bottom there, you can see it's uh, in top, you can see what the voltage looks like. First of all, if you do it uh, positive, the applied voltage is positive, you can, uh, you can see on the upper left hand side, as you go across the surface, it uh, goes positive and then a little and then a lot negative and then it goes positive again and back to down on the right there you can see if you apply a negative voltage it goes positive a little bit on the edge and then it goes really negative uh, down in between and goes back up all right now here's the problem <laughs> if you crank the voltage up really positive at, you can see at the bottom where it's really low, you get this that little blip, positive blip at 100 volts. At about 200, 300 volts, you turns out you start to generate, the electrons are sucked in, the electrons start to generate secondary electrons, and the secondary electrons form a cloud of plasma at the junction at where those two wires are connected, where that wire is. And that plasma cloud then looks to the uh, uh, rest of the plasma like it's all conducting surface. And so you get what's called snapover. All of a sudden, the entire surface looks like it's conducting. That's for a positive biased surface because you're generating so many negative electrons from the back, uh, backsplash. And then as you crank it up, it goes basically flat all the way across. Whatever the voltage you apply, that's the voltage you see across the surface. Now, the problem is when you go really negative. If you go really negative, what happens is that as you crank up the voltage, you get to the point where you can build up a large differential potential and you get an arc. So in the left-hand case, you have basically a whole conducting surface. On the right side, you have a, when you're positively, I'm sorry, when your applied voltage is negative, you're sucking in ions, it can go really negative very fast. And you can get an arc discharge like they showed you in the film. On the right is a picture of the European Eureka, Eureka solar array that they brought back, showing you how burned out and such it can be right at those little, uh, wire interconnects. You can see the little interconnects there between the cells. So hopefully that makes sense to you. And it's this whole idea of snapover. Now, it turns out that the spacecraft will charge 1 40th uh, positive and 
39 40ths negative. The reason for that is because you have to balance the electron and ion currents. And so you have to have a 39 40ths of negative surface potential to suck in the uh, protons to equal the 1 40th, uh, which are 1 40th the current of the uh, electrons. So it's area times current. And the balance at area times current, they find that solar arrays have to be very carefully biased. And I'm not going to go into it today, but the uh, Russians ground their satellites very differently than we do. We try to ground on the negative side. They try to ground in the, in the middle so that uh, you still get this differential. Anyway, it's... Um, it's a big issue because on the space station, their, their side is grounded differently on surface than we are, and it leads to these snapover effects and arcing. Now, here's the issue. The issue is this. This is for uh, power generation. It's, it shows for a 130 kilowatt nuclear reactor or for a large solar array, uh, how much the system voltage affects the weight. If you start at a below at 100 volts DC, your wiring, cabling, and such to connect all that up is 30 times, well, look like, sorry, it looks like it's five times more massive because the wires have to be bigger to prevent cable loss than if you're at 300 volts. So, and you can see at 200 volts, you're going through this this uh, breakdown uh, region, the snapover region. So the problem is that people like to run solar arrays uh, at very low voltages, but so they don't arc, but they have to run them at least up to two or 300 volts to keep the weight down from the cabling because of the way DC uh, currents flow. So that's the issue. The weight goes way up if you use DC below 200. Oops, dang it. Anyway, this is the other issue. I mentioned it by IO. If you plot out, for example, for the Earth, the magnetic field of the Earth, and then you pro then you cross product that with Z cross B, look over the right over there. The electric field is equal to 0.1 times the velocity in kilometers per second times the magnetic field in Gauss. And you can see that uh, for uh, velocity of 7.6 kilometers and the Earth's polar cap is 0.3 Gauss, you get about three tenths of a volt per meter. <clears throat> now that doesn't sound like much, but we're now talking, we've run 10 kilometer uh, tethers. We're talking, they wanted to run 100 kilometer tethers. You can start to get really high potentials drop uh, and you can see the shuttle even the, between its wings uh, 50, up to 33 meters, you can get some up to 100 volts or 10, is it? Yeah, 100 volts, uh, no, 10 volts uh, because of the just across from one tip to the wing tip. Now that doesn't usually bother you, except if you're doing these spacecraft tethers. And it's the, remember it's the vertical B versus the uh, velocity vector you're flying that gives you the V cross B, the cross product. And anyway, Juno, we had a real problem. With, we have a problem with this because the wings are fairly long and you can see that the voltage, because of the rotation, this is the potential on uh, the chassis versus the magnetic boom versus the wing, the magnetic boom is even longer you get voltage variations of up to 600 volts negative because of the induced current because of V cross B. Remember, electric field is equal to V cross B. And so at the earth, you can get, you can get uh, over the polar caps, you can get up to three tenths of a volt per meter. At, Ju at Jupiter, because it's 20,000 times higher magnetic field, you can get very substantial um, electric fields across even a small satellite because of E cross B. Now, take into consideration that Io is going through the magnetic field of Jupiter in the equatorial plane. So one side of Jupiter, I'm sorry, one side of Io has, uh, has this V cross B electric field across it 
that electric field acts as an artificial aurora and sucks electrons down into the ionosphere or up from the ionosphere. That gives you that little aurora we saw off to the left in that, in that Jupiter picture. So that, that's a side effect. You can see all the moons, by the way, the big ones, because of this V cross V effect. Basically what happens is you're moving a, a, moving a body across a magnetic field and you get a V from that and you get, because uh, you have the magnetic P field, you get an E because of V cross B. And it's substantial in Jupiter. And like I say, it even may, the moons induce uh, aurora at their field line. <clears throat> now, one last thing, I'm just gonna mention this because this turns out to be a major problem. <laughs> um, JPL launched a, uh, back in the old days, launched a, a ranger probe to the moon. The, the rangers, if you remember, were supposed to take pictures as they went into the moon. Well, they launched the thing and they, uh, the camera, they had a camera so they could take pictures. The camera was on. As it went through the ionosphere, it went through what's called the passion breakdown point. Passion breakdown is where you have two plates, you put a gas between them, and you either crank up the voltage or you crank, or you drop the pressure, and there's a sweet spot at which an electron will come off of the plate, hit an atom, ionize it, and then that one will ionize more and more and more, and you get an avalanche between the two plates. Now, if the atmosphere is too thick, the atmosphere acts as an insulator. If the atmosphere is too thin, there's nothing to uh, ionize. But in between, there is a sweet spot, and that's plotted here. This is pressure times spacing, and this is the uh, atmosphere, and you can see where the, where the uh, arcing occurs. This is the uh, voltage breakdown as the vertical scale. And uh, sure enough, the, the camera arced and blew out the thing, and so they went straight to the moon, as they're coming in, they go to receive the signal and the camera's dead because it went through passion breakdown in the ionosphere and shorted itself out. So we've been very aware, well aware of this for many years at JPL. So I think you find that amusing, but it's another aspect of spacecraft charging. Now we're gonna go to the real killer. This is the one that we're really worried about at Jupiter. Now, here's why we're worried at Jupiter. The reason I was hired at JPL is because when Voyager went by, Voyager 1 went by Jupiter, it started having anomalies. Those are, anomalies are called power on resets and they're plotted in the red shaded region up there versus time. This is as it went in closest approach. You can see the IL flux tube, you can see the solar occultation, you see the various plasma regions under miscellaneous down there. And then all of a sudden it started arcing. It had 42 of these dark discharges. Why did they care? Well, they had found from ground testing uh, that when you, uh, it was Voyager Zero, there were three Voyagers built. The one I'm sitting in the museum at JPL. If you arced it, it would, the compute, one of the computers, as I'll show you in a moment, could, could reset. The science computer would reset. That means it would reset the camera that was taking the pictures by a few milliseconds and then it would recover. So what was happening was these power on resets, the, the, flight, the, the flight computer, the main computer wasn't bothered by this, but the instrument computer was and it would be an arc and so the two computers clocks got off. And as we left Jupiter, the, uh, we slowly, as we went through uh, these millisecond resets, we slowly lost the picture of Jupiter. It actually drifted out of view because the camera was programmed to take pictures at the wrong time because it kept resetting itself. Anyway, they, went, they had done a thorough review of dielectrics and stuff on uh, Voyager and did a lot of testing. This is what, they did, what, what my, my close friend and colleague Al Whittlesey did back in 1981 after all these things occurred. They they came up that there was a hypothesized ESD current loop, where the uh, going by the computer, the, the instrument computer, and he did some ground test 
where he, where he did an arc discharge, uh, various uh, pulse widths, and found that there was a sweet spot where you could where you could cause the computer to reset if you had an arc discharge at just the right for the right uh, pulse width. So, when I came there, I calculated the uh, flux of electrons, the number, the integrated number of power on resets, and you, this is the actually the total fluence. Uh, that fluence is flux times time, and you can see the only thing that seemed to agree with it was the uh, ten, the one, one MeV and ten MeV uh, electrons. The protons didn't correlate very well, and the but the uh, uh, power on resets correlated apparently with the uh, electrons. So we immediately came to the conclusion it was a high energy electrons. And so this is my first back of an envelope calculation using my first Apple II Plus computer as plotted by the Apple II Plus computer on the right. And this appeared in a lot of project meetings. And so I did 42 events in 12 hours, that's 10 to the third seconds. And you assume the uh, flux, you take the flux, calculate that, and you get a total charge of about two times 10 to the 10th electrons per square centimeter per event at Jupiter, we're generating the upsets. Now, when he did the experiment, he came out with uh, the, the 20 nanosecond pulse, 20 microamps, and calculated the charge. And that came up with 2.5 times 10 to the 10th electrons per event. So guess what? We've come up with a rule of thumb that if you get less than if you get more than 10 to the 10th electrons per square centimeter in less than 10 hours, you're going to get one ESD. And uh, that's what we did <laughs> on, on Voyager. And so ever after, JPL has been paranoid about IESD. That's the IESD. <laughs> that's a piece of plastic. And it, it's going to build up charge inside the spacecraft on circuit boards, and when you tap it, it discharges. Now, now let me go through what we're talking about. On the left over here, you have a, a charged particle interactions. You have proton-electron energy versus the penetration depth for aluminum. So you got all about you typically run about a hundred mils of aluminum <laughs> on the exterior surface of. A, spacecraft. And you can see that the curve for electrons, that it that the electrons uh, at 100 mils, that uh, the electrons have one MeV energy, whereas for protons, it requires a proton that's almost uh, 30 MeV to penetrate. Now, we already know that the flux of electrons compared to protons is roughly 40 to 1. So what's happening is that the protons are basically being stopped at the surface of the spacecraft, by and large. Electrons, however, since they are much more penetrative, can penetrate much further into the material, they're depositing their charge inside the spacecraft on circuit boards, uh, isolated conductors, things like that. We even know, we even know of... Uh, one of the Intel sats had a, a grounded wire inside that, uh, an ungrounded wire, I'm, sa I'm sorry, ungrounded wire inside that built up charge and arced. And once they grounded it on the subsequent satellites, the problem went away. So even the, the worst example of this was an outfit that will remain unnamed because they're no longer in business, but they had put their initials on the uh, circuit board in metal picture circuit board inside the spacecraft behind 100 mils, electrons come in, they collect on the conducting uh, letters, the T arcs to the R, arcs to the W, and then the W arcs into the circuit board. And unfortunately, this, these people who shall remain nameless uh, lost their satellite. <laughs> Again, they're nameless. <laughs> Anyway, down here, <coughs> excuse me, you can see uh, the Star Trekker upsets on, I believe that was on the Discus satellite. 
Oh, no, I'm sorry, it was DSP satellite. You can see the electron count rate for three MeV electrons. The arrows are star tracker of sets. And lo and behold, whenever you got a three MeV burst of electrons, you got a discharge. Because again, it's what we have up, it's what we have here. Anyway, see how it continues to arc? Basically, it's inverse lightning. What happens is one little electron pops out uh, of the, of the, off the conductor or out of the dielectric. Cabling works the same way. We have a real problem. It turns out that the anneal cabling by shining 10 MeV beams of electrons on them at where they manufacture them. And the 10 MeV beam of electrons can build charge in the conduct in the in the uh, non-conductor around the uh, coaxial cable, and then when they bring them out, they can blow up because of all the charge that's stored in the conductor. I have uh, some samples of cables that have blown up and stuff. I've even attended IEEE conferences where that was the main discussion point. We had whole sessions on cables blowing up because of buried charge. So IESD, internal electrostatic discharge, is a real killer because the charge can build up right at the site of where your most sensitive materials are. And so what we did on uh, uh, Galileo and what we've done on Juno and doing on Europa is we put, put very things in a highly insulated, uh, basically tungsten sometimes boxes and stuntite uh, boxes so that the electrons can't get in and uh, bury themselves over a long period of time. Fortunately, charge can build, can uh, boil off with heat. And so if things get heated, the charge dissipates. So IESD is the real killer of satellites and it's not typically known. Okay, let's look at some mitigation techniques. These are two charts that you can use. These are from 4002B or 4002A, uh, which I was a uh, co-author of both documents. They are the, the primary NASA guidelines for spacecraft charging and internal electrostatic discharge. The lower left shows the uh, zone covered by the aurora and the plasma sheet. If you look, if you plot the latitude of your satellite on this plot, and its altitude, if you go through these regions, these are the worst case in eclipse that you would see uh, charging, surface charging on your satellite. So this is a tool that you can use to determine whether surface charging is gonna be a problem for you. On the right over here uh, is the IESD chart for the Earth. I have similar charts uh, for both of these things for Jupiter, but I just wanted to show you the Earth one. And again, Rule of thumb, 10 to the 10th electrons per square centimeter, less than 10 hours, you're going to get an IESD. And if you do the calculations and stuff, you can see that uh, the electron belts out near, near geostationary orbit are the most intense region of where you can get electrons, uh, IESD charging. And just one, so again, you plot your orbital inclination and you plot your altitude and decide whether or not you're going to get into a region of uh, discharge for ISD. Now, this is the main thing that you can do. Pick the proper materials. On the left are the materials to avoid. For example, anodized. Anodized surfaces are great non-conducting surfaces. Allodyne, however, is a much better way of doing your surfaces. Paints. White paints are typically terrible. They have built up charge. Black paints, because of the carbon in them, typically are much better. We also recommend when you can, and we've done this for several of our satellites, coat them in indium tin oxide. ITO coating uh, doesn't affect the uh, sensitivity to solar radiation photons, but it does make a conductive surface on your spacecraft, except that you have to remember to ground it. And that's the big issue. You need to ground the indium tin oxide coating uh, on to the bus, satellite bus so that you don't run up. So on the right, 
are things we recommend on the left of things you really don't want to use. And uh, I did something terrible on Cassini. Uh, they let me run around the spacecraft and point out where the arcing would be. And I, they, they had a beautiful gold colored Cassini spacecraft. If you look at, if you look at all the pictures and stuff, you'll see Cassini looks gold. Well, Garrett was responsible for putting black carbon black uh, surfaces underneath the main antenna and by the instruments so that they were conductive and didn't charge in art. And uh, I, I, let, let's say that the project was not happy with me because they really liked gold capped on. <laughs> that reminds me of, do you, do you know why JPL satellites cost so much? Very simple, they're made out of gold. <laughs> Look at the pictures. Anyway, <laughs> they're not. They're made out of Kapton, which is not gold. But <laughs> they look gold. <laughs> anyway, here's the general design guidelines. Ground all conductive out external spacecraft elements and in case you have them inside. Use conductive surface materials whenever you can. Shield all circuitry, Faraday cage concept. Filter circuits inside because of IESD sources. Develop document and follow procedures. Remember, I told you that funny story about how the mechanical engineer used a, a Loctite to make sure the screws didn't come loose during launch, and that was that's a real big no no. <laughs> it's terrible that he did that. That's what caused the satellite to fail. Anyway, uh, just show this. It'll be in the view graphs. Uh, this is what we did on Galileo uh, to ground everything and make sure, and you, you might want to use these rules. If, you, if you're going back to Jupiter, uh, you probably want to use these rules. Anyway, I'm going to call it quits for now and I'll ask her if there are any questions and we're going to break at 12 o'clock. Do I have any questions at this point? Any questions? <laughs> How do we do that? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? This is, yes. This is Gary Moyer at the uh, Lawndale Library, at the Lomita Library. Anyway, uh, you were talking about the, the effects of anodize. Uh, there's a similar process called tiodize uh, and lubricants uh, that were used on a number of screws that I used. Uh, does that have a similar kind of a problem? I wouldn't know the, the specific, precise thing. What you'd have to do is what we do is when you uh, do use the material, you have to do a, uh, a voltmeter and see if the, if it's conducting or not. Do a resistance measurement. We do that. We actually go around and we, we have special probes because you don't want to poke holes in things. But uh, usually like a, spoon, think of like a spoon, you put a spoon on the external one and the, we'll let a spoon on the internal one and measure the resistance. And you, we do that all over our spacecraft. And so you cannot assume a priori that any given material that you use is non-conductive or conductive. That answer? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Also explains why we were, we were so Insistent on having Faraday cages. Yep, <laughs> and I, I won't, won't mention the, the developer, but uh, they uh, well, maybe I, I didn't. It was, this is the people that didn't. That I don't use their name anyway. They, they had me come down, and um, they were having problems with the uh, uh, the Tedris satellites, and um, they had me come down and. The satellite was sitting there, and they said, you can, can I go up and look at it? And they said, yes. I went up, and I, I stood up inside, underneath. I went up inside, and, I, and the, the, pro, the program manager was there from, from a nameless company. And uh, I shouted out, I said, um, what's the shielding around here? And he said promptly, 100 mils. Everything's 100 mils. We only do 100 mils. We have no problem with spacecraft charging. And I said, but, but why am I able to stand up inside and see all the circuit boards? 
He says, oh, that's because the, the, the motor is there. And I said, uh, it's the, and then his, uh, his chief engineer turned to him, turned dead white and said, sir, we eject the motor. That entire side is exposed to the, to the spacecraft charging environment. Uh, they did some changes after that. And uh, so you have you have to check everything. My, my my best example is uh, my own satellite, uh, the Clementine Interstate satellite. Um, I went up the, the night before the launch, and I asked my engineer. I said, uh, I go through my little checklist. I said, Is there an on-off switch? They didn't have an on-off switch. <laughs> they, they were on the night before the. Thing was being fueled, soldering an on-off switch into the spacecraft. You have to ask. And in space, terms of spacecraft charging, one of the most bizarre things is that on SCAFA, uh, because of the way it was oriented and spinning, uh, the, the thermal blankets on the outside, the people that put them on would sew them down, but they didn't quite sew them down. And so what you would see was as the sun would come up over the edge of the satellite, the, uh, the thermal blanket would cast a shadow on our test samples. And uh, we went back and had to look at the pictures. And sure enough, the thermal blankets were sticking up and they were shadowing the uh, very samples we wanted to measure the spacecraft charging on. So uh, you have to be paranoid literally paranoid about this stuff. You cannot trust the next person down. You remember the old game where you, you say, uh, take the phone message and, and you whisper in one person's ear and then they whisper in the next person's ear. By the time it gets down to the third or fourth person, it's totally garbled. And that's what happens when you build satellites. And uh, I, I have many examples of that. And, but my favorite one is the on off switch. Any more questions? So any question for folks online? Online for you, you can uh, unmute your camera. You got to. Uh, any any folks online? I saw Frank. Uh, Frank, do you want to speak out? Yes. I saw your mic. Yeah, no, that's fine. I got a question. Is that you're talking about how bad things are up at Geo? I was wondering if you've ever looked at the Mio orbit on GPS, which I'm associated. We had a lot of questionable behavior, which I'm beginning to involve with spark, um, uh, you know, um, electrostatic discharge. On block ones, the processor would periodically reset itself and, and lose its memory pointer, and so they always were chasing after it. On block two and block ones, we saw a lot of degradations in our solar arrays, and now you're showing me these pictures of arc over. And I'm going like, hmm, that, that, that looks suspicious. And the other thing that I point out is that uh, Maui Tracking has always noted that GPS satellites got redder as they aged. And that uh, I was suspicious because we used to put the solar cells um, on top of our TV on the uh, solar panels. So I'm looking at that arcing situation and going like, are we blowing off solar cells and exposing the RTV on the bottom? So yes. I don't know. Any thoughts on yes. that? <laughs> yes. Uh, GPS. I have a paper I'm reviewing right now. I can't tell you who it's by, but they're specifically taking the data from the geosynchronous environment from the Los Alamos detectors and predicting how bad the charging is going to be at Neo. <laughs> so, <laughs> when will that paper be? Uh, when will that paper be available? Because I'm very interested in that topic. Uh, it's coming out with the uh, JSR proceedings from the original space uh, technology uh, thing. You can, uh, I'm trying to think how, how to tell you to go about it. Uh, you can, the particular paper is being edited by Linda Negard Parker. You probably, you may know her. And well, was, I've, I've seen the name around. I'm gonna have to go find it. Yeah, because, she's the editor yeah. for that. Uh, she, can she can tell you. Uh, uh, I just got the paper. 
And, but anyway, to make a long story short, of course, <laughs> the biggest problem with GPS is that it's in the middle of the proton belts. Oh, I know that. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> and, the, uh, and you also go through the South Atlantic anomaly, uh, the upper top part of it. And so the whole yeah, part, well, so in the aging, the redness you're thinking, uh, there was a bunch of studies done. I don't know. I think they're actually for GPS. And I'm not thinking about it. That they were worried about contamination, long term contamination or arcing. And I know that for uh, that uh, Dale Ferguson, who died recently, was, is, was doing papers where he was looking at geo and I think the GPS satellites. And he was, he believes he was measuring continual arcing on those satellites using the Arecibo facility. He said, was at Oh, AFR I'd love to all. see that paper too. Well, yeah, you, well, there's you, also you look up Dale Ferguson. His papers have all been published. He died about a year and a half ago, but sure. all the papers were published no. at the spacecraft charging conferences and in IEEE and in JSR. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a problem. And, <laughs> and the question was, was it contamination or was it the arcing? And he claimed he could actually hear the arcing. Hmm. See, that would show up as face noise on the GPS signal. That's what he and said. I'm, I'm suspicious <laughs> now because we've seen various uh, cases where satellite is uh, different from other satellites. And it's always bugged me. It's just like, why did that satellite have such a poor URE? So now I want I want to go up and take pictures of them uh, someday. I, you know, I, I don't understand why we're not out and doing <laughs> us. Orbit I, surveys I, did, of, I, did, uh, I did work for Star Wars. I won't go there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but should have been there, and I hopefully someday they'll do, they'll release all these pictures and that. So, okay, thank you very much. This has been quite uh, illuminating. <laughs> Appreciate it. Sparking. <laughs> uh, Any more questions? Uh, I see Fa uh, Fanny. Fanny, uh, unmute her uh, the uh, the mic. Uh, Fanny, do you want to speak out? Benny? Hi. Yep. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you. Yeah. I had a question about optics. Um, do you have any comments on arcing in optics? Like oh, I got lots optics? of comments on arcing. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any references to, yeah. Well, the, suggest. Bottom, the bottom line is that typically glasses aren't very conductive. You can make them conductive, but uh, they typically aren't. And uh, you, the, the, the only thing is that uh, the, it turns out you can really screw up optics pretty bad with arc discharges and stuff in them. Uh, what you were seeing was actually plexiglass being arced there. Mm -hmm. And that'll happen to your glass. And they have brought back surfaces and lenses and windows and stuff, and they'll have uh, Lichtenberg patterns in them. Those are called Lichtenberg patterns. And uh, the bottom line is, though, I've built lots of telescopes and I've worked on telescopes. You can, you can damage about a 20 or 30% of the telescope and <laughs> not even notice it, mm -hmm. as, you, as, you real, as you know. So the, uh, my, my first thing is, yes, the glasses can arc and they can be damaged by Lichtenberg patterns. The thing is, though, that it takes a lot to really make a huge difference in a... Uh, in uh, in optics, as far as from my own personal experience, but yes, it happens. And uh, one of the things that happened was the lenses on the Galix. I was asked to do a study of those. The uh, lenses on there were building up charge and causing the uh, uh, subsequently the X-rays, wherever it was, it, not X-rays, but the uh, causing an electric field. That was screwing up the uh, sensor behind it. Mm, okay. You, see, you, you know what I'm trying to say? You yeah. Know, they had an electrostatic sensor behind it, and the lens itself built up charge. I see. Okay, thank you. Any more? Any question online, folks online? Of course, you got another chance uh, at the end uh, uh, after the session, too. But it is a good time right now. Uh, Gary, do you have more questions? 
I'm a little curious about the Molniya orbit since they have such uh, a varied range of, uh, of altitudes and also uh, high inclination. That's right. And uh, also they come down typically over the United States and then down to the South Atlantic anomaly, if I remember right. <laughs> so, they, yes, they have problems. The big thing is that they are going to be exposed directly to the uh, proton events, the total mass ejections and, and flares, uh, the two different things. But the uh, coronal mass ejections and the, the intense proton bursts that you get from those, particularly when you go, when you remember that you're outside the magnetosphere at the high point. And uh, which, as you come down into the Earth, the, uh, the, they can be exposed to the protons directly. That's the main, and radiation is the main thing for them. Spacecraft charging, of course, they'll go through all these regions. And I gave you two plots. You can just plot their, plot their orbits on either one of those plots and you can see uh, what the uh, charging or what the uh, uh, event, what the uh, uh, IESD events are going to be. So radiation is a major problem because of protons. Uh, the uh, spacecraft <clears throat> charging, you just take my plots and plot the orbit you're worried about. Remember those orbit, those pictures I showed you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I had the Russians published uh, any ex extensively on this subject or not? Yes. In fact, the Russians were the first people that predicted this subject. They... Uh, Back in like 56, 57, uh, the Russians were starting to worry about it. And the, the, they actually did the, I have a review paper in my references at the end, if you look it up on the review of spacecraft charging. And uh, I have all Alper and all those people, I have their papers all quote there in, in my review. And I went back and reviewed the literature starting back in the 50s. And uh, it, they, they did a lot of work on this initially. And they come to all the spacecraft charging conferences and speak. Very interesting. They may not uh, now. Very interesting. I have several, I have several Russian friends. <laughs> Could you uh, talk about um, a little bit about their grounding. You said the grounding is, is different. It's in the middle. It's not at yeah, the end if, line. If I remember exactly, and I may be getting actually mixed up. If I remember, we typically ground our satellites to the negative side. And the satellite bus grounds to the negative side of the array, whereas the Russians ground to the middle of the array. And the problem we have is that on the space station, there's two pieces to the space station. There's the U.S. part, the international part, and there's the Russian part. And we don't, I was told that we do not exactly know how they're grounded on their side. And uh, the difference is this. Um, you, where you want your potentials to be, the grounding to the negative side, if I remember, causes the, uh, the the array to go negative. And so it's uh, not, uh, it's, it's attracting low current ions. Whereas if, if it's in the middle, uh, what happens is you can shift the potential of the the, the uh, solar array will, will have this one to 50 ratio. 50 of it's going to be positive and uh, one fiftieth of it's gonna be negative. And so you can have uh, you can have the snap uh, you, you can have the arcing problem because you're worried about the arcing for the uh, uh, positive part of it. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Again, at the end, uh, you have more uh, another chance to ask about the uh, spacecraft charging. But anything further? Uh, well, I, I'll add one more thing. The astronauts, uh, we've had big arguments. I was heavily involved in these uh, about their world charging and such. And so it's been decided that, that people were trying to shut them down. They have plasma contactors on the space station, neutral plasma generators 
And when astronauts go out, they turn those on and try to ground it out. And I'm not sure if they worry about the aurora or not. I know that I've talked to some of the astronauts and they actually have stood up in the aurora, but uh, that was on uh, Skylab. Uh, Owen Gary had told me he actually been out in aurora. And, uh, so, but I think that they, they're more circumspect about these things. It turns out that the uh, spacesuits that we used to use, um, they, uh, they could pass a shock through them and they put a sheep inside, exposed it to about a three or 400 volt arc and kill the sheep. So they've been paranoid about, not paranoid, but been concerned about that ever since then. We did an entire, I took part in an entire study on the uh, charging of the space station and uh, all that, that stuff. You can get that from Joe Minow. Who was responsible for that? Do you all know who Joe Minow is? <laughs> anyway, he's the chief technologist for for this area for space environments at the uh, at Marshall and at uh, the uh, Engineering Sister Center in Virginia. You can find his name M I N O W. It'll show up real easily. Okay, do you want to break for lunch then? I, can I ask? Hi, Ken. I'm sorry, I put a chat note out there. It's Patrick Clancic. I have a quick question if there's a moment. I don't know how to get the chats. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I didn't put the question there. Uh, so, yeah, you mentioned right toward the end a uh, sort of a major concern about Loctite. Is that something that I drift off for a moment, or is it, what, did you speak about that in any detail? Or, I mean, there yes. is a fair amount of Loctite. Uh, at, the very beginning, at the very beginning. I pointed out. I was that, late getting on. I apologize. Yeah, I, I'm it, well. It'll be in the in the recording. And okay. I mentioned that the discus satellite, a discus satellite, failed while Nixon was dancing with the, the with Madame Ch uh, uh, Chiao in uh, uh, in China. Remember, he went over and went with Mayo and Madame, and he danced with Mayo. Of Madame Mao, in the middle of that, the discus satellite died. This <laughs> caused a great diplomatic furor. As a result of that, they did a very thorough investigation of the discus satellites. And during that process, they found out that indeed there had been a specific rule said that all cables leading into the spacecraft, their outside conductor should be grounded to the spacecraft bus. As a result of that, they, uh, they mechanically bolted the uh, conductor to the spacecraft. It was discovered after the fact that the people, the mechanical engineers who bolted the stuff down used Loctite. And depending on the satellite and how much Loctite they put on there, they had arc discharge problems apparently. And on one of the satellite that was lost, that put a lot, apparently put a lot of extra Loctite. So that's that's the that's that's the apocryphal story I heard. <laughs> okay, no, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It, you can treat it whatever you want, but it ties into Nixon dancing with Ma <laughs> Madame Mao. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> So y'all want a break for lunch? Yeah, okay, uh, let's have a, a break, uh, but we'll still come back at one. Uh, so uh, let's have a, a lunch break now. All right, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna keep my computer running. Okay. And did you, you should see the meteoroid debris on there. Yeah. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay.